Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Lucifer Rising, my name is Eric, and I'm here with uh, fellow atheist Michael Kester. Yeah, how's it going? Not a lot of believers in Lucifer on our show. No, uh, rising today. or otherwise. But we do have a year-end episode. Yeah. A uh, We got renewed for a year six, we can do whatever the fuck we want <laughs> episode, I think is. This is us being irresponsible. Yeah. What are the movies before we talk about all that could have been? Well, we are going to do the... Paul Verhoeven classic RoboCop. God damn. And then we're going to do that next to the Christopher Columbus epic Bicentennial Man in a uh, Robots with Everyday Jobs episode. Paulie's Robot Memorial Show is what this <laughs> is going to be. A Paulie's Robot Memorial special, uh, which wasn't even this year. That was, God, I can't even believe it's been that long since uh, Rocky and Asia. That's just crazy it's to me. A long time since Asia. I know. We totally got Asia, and then we went, uh, let's not do any more of yeah. those movies for a year. <laughs> Whoops. We did the totally, I. Totally accidental. I kid, this year seemed to go by much, much quicker than the uh, previous. Yeah, it really did. But we can talk about that uh, next week on the year-end recap, uh, Total Waste of Everyone's Time show. For this show, I want to do something a little different. We talk, I would say, a lot to try and get these uh, these movies together. We go back and forth with a lot of ideas, and we've discussed that a little bit on the show. We're doing RoboCop and Bicentennial Man today, but uh, you threw out a lot of ideas for yeah. RoboCop. Yeah, I did. About every week for the last seven weeks, you go, <laughs> RoboCop, can we, is there something we could do with RoboCop? And then because I'm really helpful when we're pairing up movies, I go, I don't know. Can you also think of the other movie? Right. And uh, do you remember some of the things you, you went a couple directions with this. I wrote them down because <laughs> I thought they were all amazing. So first we were going cops. You remember that direction? Right. Yes. The runners up. This is what you could have gotten. The and all that could have been uh, for RoboCop was RoboCop and SuperCop. Yeah. RoboCop and Beverly Hills Cop. <laughs> My favorite. This is my favorite one. RoboCop. You're at the end of your rope on this one. RoboCop and Paul Blart Mall Cop. That was your yeah. final cop suggestion. I was really close to going, yeah. I was, absolutely. Really, how, I was really hoping for that one. How would we not do RoboCop and Paul Blart Mall Cop? But then you also went the short circuit direction, which right. I thought was kind of interesting. Misunderstood robots. I'll cut to the chase on that. I think when we were pairing uh, robot and robot, your best suggestion was RoboCop and RoboGeisha. Yeah. <laughs> that was, you know, talk about getting back to the Asia. I always want to do Judge Dredd and Demolition Man together. I don't know why. I think it'd be a terrible show. Yeah, it's but, uh, uh, because, probably because in a Sylvester Stallone is a badass with a shitty sidekick double feature. Deep a derp a diddly derp a derp a dum. Ging gang gong to do gong de la garaga. Yeah, that's what I meant. Well, let's talk about uh, spoilers. Yeah. I almost said Robocop, but spoilers. We're going to spoil Robocop. And uh, I don't think we could possibly spoil everything in Bicentennial Man given only 45 minutes, <laughs> but we'll probably spoil a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't seen Robocop or read Isaac Asimov, uh -huh. go ahead and skip those uh, movies using the chapters. You can uh, even skip. For maybe the last time ever, chapters in your MP3 file. We'll talk about that on the next show. For this show, I'll buy that for a dollar. Can we just start with I'll buy that for a dollar? I will buy that for a dollar. I don't even know what the fuck that show is yeah. inside the RoboCop universe. What uh -huh. are they doing on the I'll buy that for a dollar show? I don't know. It's just the ultimate kick in the pants yeah. to those fucking terrible uh, television so programs. Paul Verhoeven, in that image that you showed me, which I studied extensively, is maybe like the third name from Michael Bay, which is the top of the list. Oh, yeah. We should talk about that, too. Again, let's save it for next time. I'm just packing things into the next show so it'll be relevant to hopefully someone. So that we can make an hour out of it, is what you're saying. Yeah, right. But Paul Verhoeven did Starship Troopers, which I will still go on record and say is possibly one of my favorite sci-fi movies of all time. Sure. And uh, he's notable for doing 
very obvious James Cameron esque films that they do the sci fi thing of social commentary, mm -hmm. but the lens is so plain. Yeah. You'll remember back in Starship Troopers, they did the fucking news thing. Sure. And on the news, it was, it was, oh, the government sure doesn't seem to care about violence. Right. right. Stupid government. Good thing that's not like the real government, or is it? <laughs> sure. I think I buy that. I'd buy that for a dollar. It's just a commentary on '80s bullshit game shows, because that was when. I mean, a lot of the the game shows that you and I grew up with were really in, hitting their right. stride. This was uh, right. It's after the heyday. It's after the um, the Gong Show. Yeah, it was after the Gong Show and the dating game and the the, right. the what was it the show show or whatever the hell. <laughs> But before the new era of atheist libertarian game show hosts. Right. That uh, is also fantastic. Also before that brief thing that happened in the late 2000s where it was just versions of who wants to be a millionaire, but you tortured the person who you were asking the questions. <laughs> oh, right. I remember that. Um, this was We never got to our logical conclusion on that string. I would have liked to see us push <laughs> that envelope a little further. Um Although I think it's kind of close with Celebrity Apprentice, but I've promised you I will not discuss Celebrity Apprentice on our show. Until next week. <laughs> Robocop is, I mean, it is social commentary, but it's its one of the few Paul Verhoeven movies where we focus on an individual as opposed to a broader, Right. I mean, Starship Troopers especially is a, is a universal look at the state of things. And uh, eventually we'll get showgirls on here, and that's a little bit more personal, but still, that's a look at an industry. Right. This is about, it's less about police, and it's less about crime, and it's more about a person. Yeah, I think the world's important, too, but you're right, it's the titular RoboCop. Sure. You know, Paul can't stop himself from making a really compelling world, and I like when he doesn't focus on the world, right? Because it's going to show up whether he wants it to or not. Exactly. You know, we're going to get this uh, dystopia, Detroit kind of state that it's in, and I think the you know the I'll buy that for a dollar. It's one of the quotable RoboCop lines, but there's so many of them. I actually tweeted that I was watching RoboCop for the show. And I got a reply from a Twitter bot. I don't know. I know you're not <laughs> super immersed in Twitter, but Twitter bots are these things that exist that just kind of like search for people talking about things and then respond with something. Uh -huh. So this automated machine responds with, I'll buy that for a dollar to every person talking about RoboCop. <laughs> There's no variation. It's just if you if you go on Twitter right now and talk about RoboCop, this person will probably respond with i'll buy that for a dollar to you that's it's just hilarious. a great thing that exists that's perfect let's talk about the world first then before getting into robocop himself sure it's so fucking 80s oh yeah so 80s. the graphics everything on a you know a shitty computer grid <laughs> or the scan lines the uh -huh. i also think the matte black police cars add a lot to that you know kind of look sure but there was, I've, I just showed you this, um, Far Cry Blood Dragon. Yes. Which is part of this kind of resurgence of 80s stuff that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. It's this game done in the vein of an 80s action movie. It's actually an addition to an existing game, a, a fairly popular game called Far Cry 3. And they redid the entire graphical aesthetic of the game to look like it's from one of these you know, 80s action, sci-fi. Sure. The guy is missing an eye and has a robotic arm or whatever. Right. I bought it immediately, of course. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? If you look up at the sky in the game, you can see scan lines. <laughs> from the, <laughs> And there's, you know, there's VHS flips and stuff. That's awesome. I love that that's coming back in vogue. Oh, yeah. I think, man, that I talked about it so much on the Videodrome show. Sure. But just that shitty 80s beta you know, How to Destroy Angels, I just saw them uh, play a show. They're uh -huh. using a lot of that glitchy VHS stuff. It's uh -huh. all coming back. I love it. The guys who did Bellflower are going to be putting out a movie that's really heavily based on 80s sci-fi and 80s side-scrolling platformer fighting games. <laughs> Great. Um, which, well, that was part of that, too. We haven't gotten into the, the side-scrolling platformer part, but right. that was also... That was part of RoboCop. Do you remember that in Ro with RoboCop? 
What are you talking about? Do you remember about? how the RoboCop video game was one of the best selling oh, NES yeah. games of all oh, time? Totally. It's because RoboCop it, it like you said, the world is immersive enough that you can have stuff happen without it being the plot to the film. Yeah. But the character is insanely iconic. And also right. so correct me if I'm wrong, because this I have to actually betray a lot of my own feelings to admit. Peter Weller is the actor yeah. playing, playing Robocop. Peter Weller is probably one of my top three favorite actors of all time. Awesome. I saw him in Naked Lunch. He was in Dexter for a while. He's in the latest Star Trek movie. He's Batman's voice in the latest round of uh, Batman okay. stuff. I fucking... Uh, the animated stuff with Michael Emerson. Yeah. I fucking love, love Peter Weller. Good. I'm glad. And I think he is at his best in these sci-fi movies. He was in Leviathan mm -hmm. and Screamers. Like he does all these really, all the 80s sci-fi and horror movies that you saw at fucking video value or family rental right. when you were right. too young to be allowed to rent them yourself. But uh, I feel like Peter Weller serves this role in such a wonderful way because for me and for you and for probably a lot of our audience, I can say Peter Weller and you can picture him as a person, picture all the movies he's been in, remember his right. lines from Naked Lunch. But generally, I don't feel like Robocop is Peter Weller. Sure. Well, he's got a mask on for most right. of the movie. It's not the uh, Terminator. Terminator is Arnold Schwarzenegger, but his face comes off. Yeah. Right. Robocop is a robotic cop that Peter Weller moves around inside of. Sure. Yeah. Well, also kind of funny that you mentioned Terminator. The Terminator versus Robocop idea is probably the longest standing thing outside of Freddy versus Jason. Yeah. In people are dying to see it. There's fan fiction written about it. Yeah. There's always almost a real property for it, and it just doesn't happen. Nobody wants to I, put the two next to each other. I love Robocop, but just based on everything I've heard about how hard it is to move around inside that suit. <laughs> that's what you're going with, huh? I mean, are we talking T-1000 or T-2000? Great question. Wrong show to invoke those robots. We have to talk about Stop Motion Bot on this show. That's... Oh, my God. What's his name? <laughs> he's got a name. Yeah, he's the 209. How can you forget <laughs> the Stop Motion 209? Yeah. Uh, who's part of, you know, another part of this world. I think more so a character than wallpaper in the world. The wallpaper stuff I think of as dystopia, as Detroit. Sure. A lot of it still involves characters. It's the fact there's crime everywhere, even in the police station. Sure. Or, you know, the gangs. The um, I always forget the name because I know him in his role as a kind of a movie trope of that one black guy with a high-pitched laugh. Yeah. He's kind of his own <laughs> fucking weird thing from RoboCop. But these movies where you see the cars on fire in the streets yeah. and the mega corporation and... Nobody's shopping. Nobody's <laughs> ever shopping. Well, and, and Verhoeven does this great thing where he also inserts these little ads, that mm -hmm. very Starship Troopers thing, the heart transplant and sure. Nukem. Just sure. trying to give you an idea of this, uh, this world. Right. But the stop motion bot is kind of the arch nemesis for the first half of the movie mm -hmm. he's the the future of law enforcement sure that scene where he's introduced <laughs> oh also my God. so this is why i think about it a lot as the the feeling or the aesthetic of the movie is because that's when you first start seeing the gore yep is. that's when that's when the camp gets introduced so yeah. in your face so you have 20 seconds to comply and it's just so that's scary to me. I know it's so you put down the gun immediately sure. because because why, there's but, a fucking exo squad pointed at you. Who keeps a giant gun in their boardroom? This is the future. There's gangs in the police station. I understood it for the the purpose of the demo, but that giant gun is still in the boardroom later in the movie. Yeah. I just don't know who keeps that in there. <laughs> uh, once he puts the gun down, the next possible move for the robot to make to go, hey, uh. You have 15 seconds to comply now. That's just panic. That's just what the fuck are you going to do? Yep. <laughs> and I didn't anticipate how brutal that would feel. Sure. You know, just getting mauled through by those bullets. And I think the fact that he doesn't crash out of the window, which is kind of what you expect, mm -hmm. but that his bullet ridden corpse lands on the table and forces everyone to kind yeah. of deal with that. Right. And then seeing the reaction of 
oh my my tech demo failed Mm -hmm. oh this is really embarrassing and then and then it immediately it's it's supposed to conjure up the film itself but that scene especially is supposed to conjure up this thing that's become a kind of a stupid argument and especially people my age Mm -hmm. i know that you're you're doing that thing where you're in a huge corporate world out and and everybody's like a little bit more sensible maybe maybe we did talk about all the granola and the backpacking so that's true yeah i have a bunch of hippies because i'm in my 20s in chicago on the west side they call them hipsters now sure but they're just they're just hippies who like vinyl (laughs) right (laughs) and so there's this thing where uh you go to a a supermarket where or uh like a Walgreens or CVS, or I don't know, there's different names for these types of pharmacies, depending on which part of the country you are in. But it's right. It's kind of like an, a hyper convenience store, but they have pills yeah. and frozen pizza. Yeah. And you go in there and they have these automated tellers. And every time a fucking store decides they're putting in automated tellers, I hear people being like, yeah, fucking robots taking everybody's jobs. Burr, 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 everybody's, <laughs> right. I can't believe that robots are going to take the place of common people. And I'm sitting there going, who built the robots? Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm glad you bring that up in RoboCop because we're going to hit on that a lot in Bicentennial Man yeah. as well. It's just a heavy theme of I just, the robots are coming to take our jobs. It's like a fucking South Park thing. It's so stupid. And it, I So think, you don't think the 209 is going to take anybody's job? Well, here's the thing. Because humans don't come in stop motion. No, they don't come in stop motion. And as we see later in RoboCop, human robot cops never make mistakes. So the reason I feel like that's a little bit less of a theme, but you're right, definitely a theme. Uh, You hear the police talk about it in RoboCop, but Murphy dies before he's ever made into the cop. Right. So this doesn't become just man versus machine. Sure. This becomes the two types of machines. Right. Which is a, a an area of RoboCop I don't think people give it enough credit for. The man versus machine is cla- – that's Terminator. Mm-hmm. And Terminator eventually exists long enough that it has these different takes on it. But uh, Murphy, as soon as the, he has the holes blown through him mm-hmm. – and that's also another one of those scenes, just dark – gooey blood my favorite kind of blood hand blown off riddles yeah. with holes in 80s fashion still stays alive yeah well and, and, and shot a million times again let me just give some credit to peter weller do you just as he's getting the irons put to him do you just go man this guy's not having a good day <laughs> right i feel like a lesser actor would have just been like whatever i'm coming back as robocop <laughs> Right. But <laughs> right. but instead Murphy Murphy as as Weller sees him as a human being who is getting sure. fucking blown away. <laughs> right, yeah. But the technology is then there to enhance him instead of take his job. Mm-hmm. This isn't we're gonna replace all the police with robotic cops. This is We can rebuild him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Although you want to talk about somebody having a bad day, I think toxic waste guy is probably having the worst <laughs> day. Again, eighties. We talked about it's that. the toxic waste guy with the car blows apart. I mean, it is uh, that that trauma kind of stuff. Yeah, we talked about toxic waste pretty extensively in our first Jason Killapalooza. There, do you remember that talk? <laughs> I do. <laughs> about I do how remember. for some reason in the eighties, people were under the impression that there were barrels of toxic <laughs> green goo in alleys. I know. I know. Isn't that crazy? And in the sewer, the smoky uh, Manhattan sewers. Oh God, Jason takes Manhattan. It's just. Mm-hmm. And then ending with the next stab, too. That's another really gory moment, I remember, where it's it's literally he stabs the guy in the neck and someone off camera is just pouring a bucket of gooey blood. Yeah. <laughs> just a big splash on the chest. The introduction of RoboCop, though, when the machine does start to take over the man and, you know, lose the arm and that stuff. That's another area of RoboCop I think is not just fun, but kind of fucking brilliant that people don't give it credit for. Mm hmm. He gets shot up, and then we're seeing stuff from his point of view, and it goes from uh, him in the hospital trying to save his life. He flattens and calls the, the time of death, and then it blacks out. And when it comes back, it comes back to the first point of view of the machine. We don't get them wheeling his corpse away and doing, you know, whatever with it and all this bureaucratic stuff the movie seems like it might tell us. Ah, the corporation, you know, is having some power struggle to see if we can get this tech and this guy and what's going to win out. Uh 
Instead, it's literally just the first thing that it's the last thing that Murphy sees, the first thing that Robocop sees. And we get these little snippets of, you know, them turning on the vision for the first time sure. and screwing in the grid, which is so funny. Yeah. Um, and just these, you know, a couple seconds and then it leaps forward in time and we get another couple seconds. It's showing things about, it's getting us excited to see RoboCop, mm -hmm. but it's also filling us in, in that kind of, um, you know, REC style cut from scene to scene, try and catch up with what might've happened between the scenes. Sure. Turning on and off. We get that, you know, New Year's Eve party, which I just fucking love. It adds this REC type element to it that is, I mean, in itself, fascinating and interesting enough that movies would later, REC and Cloverfield and a lot of those Handycam movies, would pick up on that. We talked a lot about what, what inspired those movies from the Cannibal Holocaust kind of angle, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I feel like they've really picked up in addition to that is going, well, a lot could have happened between these little chunks. We could use these chunks as, as soon as the camera turns back on, the audience sits up and starts mining for information. Right. And I love that about it. It's a brilliant thing, I think, Robocop I, You does. know, the thing that I think is the strongest point to make with the film Robocop, mm -hmm. and this is for all you people who somehow have both not seen it and not figured out how to chapter. Right. So Zune users. The thing about Robocop is that you see the cover and it's a fucking monster robot stepping out of a car and the tagline is something like he's coming for you for justice or some shit <laughs> right. you know what i mean right and then you watch the film and like i said it's about this guy and he's a human being and it's about the humanity of robocop right and um initially you get the idea that robocop is a unstoppable killing machine and he is the perfect Ne isn't it no the tagline is something like the next generation of law enforcement i think that's, that's one what it too is. yeah i always remember you know half person all cop or something yeah. <laughs> half machine all cop half man half robot all police officer yeah right thank you i want to see the prequel where robocop's a dare officer <laughs> but no you you were just saying and i think this is one of the weirdest and most wonderful parts about the movie is that robocop can't quite break away from having been Murphy. Right. And whether or not that ends up separating him positively or negatively from Ed 209, it does <laughs> become a massive fault to RoboCop as a performance machine. It's a bug in the system. It's the uh, the pitfall of the architecture. <laughs> well, we talked about that in Terminator being the uh you know, my favorite fucking part of Terminator. It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. You know, there's supposed to be no weakness to the Terminator. The weakness of RoboCop is he's emotional. Yeah. <laughs> That's his, his only weakness is his, he's a robot that has nightmares. Right. He gets lost in his memories. He'll be out on the job about to apprehend a suspect and he'll start getting fucking nom flashbacks. Sure. Of the night he was killed and yeah. his family. He's a robot with emotional problems. Right. Which I don't think is the worst weakness in the movie because the 209 has stairs <laughs> that's nothing can stop the 209 unless you have a, a stairwell nearby and then yeah it's fucked when we talk about bicentennial man uh the three laws are going to come sure. up robocop has the you know the three directives right. that could have been his primary weakness the three directives are pretty straightforward but i love the secret fourth directive yeah i think it's actually kind of a nice moral lesson you know, that those who create power will often feel immune to that very power. Mm -hmm. This idea of law enforcement being above the law or TSA doesn't have to go through security checks or, right. you know, branches of governments creating systems of checks and balances that don't apply to them. Yeah. <laughs> only apply to the people working under them. Sure. And uh, that is Directive 4. Right. But uh, the three laws we can talk about quite a bit in Bicentennial Man. I also... You know LP, yes. right? The, yeah. Um, did the song Fly Anthology with t -Rez. Uh huh. I don't know if you ever heard the album he did before that, uh, but there's a song on it called Stepfather Factory. Mm -hmm. It's talking about building tomorrow's fathers today. Yeah. It's very much what uh, Bicentennial Man reminds me of. Right. 
And there are really, I think there's two things we talk about here. There is the bicentennial man, and then there's also Isaac Asimov. Yeah. Now, you have a lot to say about Asimov. I do. And we run the, the gamut where, I mean, it's hard to talk about Asimov knowing that we might also talk about robot farts. It is true. You know, it's true. <laughs> it, this is a really strange place to talk about Isaac yeah. Asimov, but I, I think it must be done. Isaac Asimov is, I mean, in my opinion, in most people's opinion, one of the first and most extensive creators of robots in science fiction. Right. Uh, that's just his thing. He didn't invent robots. That was Carol Chopek technically invented the word robot. Really? Yeah. But Asimov kind of took it and ran with it. Sure. And Asimov, uh, Asimov is responsible for the three laws of robotics. It's the same thing that they talk about in iRobot. The thing that, that where it's, oh man, I wish I had them written down, but it's, it's don't harm the humans. Yeah. Obey the orders as long as you don't harm the humans and protect yourself as long as you can obey orders and not harm the humans. Right. Yeah. And we uh we kind of see those priorities come into play, especially when they first get the robot. We toy with that a sure. lot. Sure. And and the movie is based on two things. It's based on The Bicentennial Man, which is a short story that Isaac Asimov wrote that eventually was expanded into a full novelization called The Positronic Man. Sure. Which the two stories married together are essentially the story that we get in Bicentennial Man, the film. Right. But the other big player in here outside of Isaac Asimov, who in my opinion, just can tell one of can can tell the most compelling stories about the humanity of robotics mm. and the robotics of humanity <laughs> right. and marrying them. Right. Um, we also have Chris Columbus, mm -hmm. and and I will I will go on record and say that something like Home Alone, yeah, yeah, right, something that should, for all intents and purposes, just not stand up to time <laughs> or relevance or Twice. whatever yeah home alone i think is one of it's one of the moments where directorially it, he has shown so strongly with his ability to make an enjoyable film but also make it have emotion and feeling and and not just feel like an empty slapstick mm -hmm. 90 minutes yeah right which is why i think on paper i would say absolutely not christopher columbus for bicentennial man <laughs> but then when i see the script and we have to have an android standing in front of world congress and pleading that he is a human being <laughs> right in the same film where he discovers anal gas i can't think of a better director <laughs> before we move off the asimov stuff you also mentioned um what was it? The, the positronic, positronic man was, was that the, the full length one. Yeah, I, I know that from the positronic brain being another one of those concepts that like the three laws has been picked up in so many different places uh, by name or even just uh, by by concept as how we talk about artificial intelligence in movies right. and in literature. Sure. You know, just writing fiction that kind of piggybacks off Asimov did these these great things where he had this mind to come up with concepts more than um, simple getting us from A to B type mechanisms. Right, exactly. These are not the, uh, you know, we invented the whatever device. Right. These are real core things that you can kind of latch onto. You can draw, you can basically use them to write your own fiction. Exactly. All right, what if we had robots that had to obey these laws? Sure. Well, what about if we put them in a place where they didn't need laws? We remove laws to save, you know, room in their memory. We Right. I mean, you can play around with this stuff a lot. Yeah, it's it's always with the stories that Asimov could come up with. It was always along the lines of, okay, so we have these accepted tenets. Right. But now let's challenge that in this way. Sure. So, you have you have the three rules of robotics, right? Yeah. And then bicentennial man is so assuming they follow the rules to the best of their ability what if they eventually get to become human right do they still have to follow the rules or do they put themselves before themselves sure. or where does this journey end for 
for that one robot whose artificial intelligence happened to tweak in the right way. Right. And then you get, start getting into the notion of the evolution of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which this film comes out and says, if robots were to evolve, they would evolve into people. <laughs> right. Not bigger, badder robots that would come back from Skynet and destroy everyone. Well, and I don't want to point out the obvious, but there's that question of what makes us human. Sure. And I think that's Bicentennial Man as a film is obsessed with that. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, it's what the movie's all about. If I replace my liver, am I a human then? What if I have a nervous system? Am I suddenly a human? Sure. If I can ejaculate, I'm human then, right? The answer is yes on that one. <laughs> when you can ejaculate, you're human. People act like, you know, we're going to use the Turing test and there's all these philosophical questions. Yeah. If you can ejaculate, you are human. I'm pretty sure all mammals can ejaculate. <laughs> Damn it. My theory has already been disproven, but that's science for you guys. Living in California, I am also within an hour of the kink.com building. Oh, yeah. So I know for a fact that ejaculating robots does not <laughs> a human make. Is that... So one of the pieces of Asimov's background we haven't talked about that I think plays into this is the guy was a biochemist. Yeah. You know, he's a biochemist who wrote fiction. You want to talk about, uh, you know, people bitching about these movies that don't get the science right. Mm -hmm. I mean, Asimov came from that background first. And I think that's one of the things that makes his work really interesting. Stuff like Nightfall or the Foundation Stories all of the, you know, he had a ton of different things where he would use this mechanism he created. This wasn't just for other people. He would create this core concept and go, all right, everybody, you can play with this concept now. And then he would do it himself. And he wrote tons of fiction just expanding on some of those things. Yeah. So I get the Asimov and I get the Chris Columbus. Uh, Robin Williams is the Robin Williams, the third awkward uh, leg on the stool. Yeah, and I think you know Robin Williams as good a wild card as any in this equation. Sure, you know was it just the time and place? Was it Nanu Nanu? I, Why Robin Williams is a robot? Robin Williams. This was what maybe two thousand twenty oh one when this came out. Nineteen ninety nine. Okay, yeah. So that was after the Aladdin thing and uh, toys and Jumanji. And I mean, this was this was Robin Williams as a leading man. So you think finishes up with Aladdin looking for the next big thing? Well, you you got to you got to hand it to an actor like Robin Williams who can bring the gravity at the same time making something funny. Yeah, right. He's really versatile in that way. We saw him play the exact opposite character when we did Insomnia on the show. Totally. But until very dark, very serious character that was maybe a little funny here right. and there. But until uh, Robin Williams live on Broadway and he alienated his entire wholesome family audience. I'm glad you think that's when that happened as well. <laughs> Robin Williams was this guy that families were comfortable letting into their home to make these grave points because he'd been on television since, you know, forever. And he was just a household name. He was a huge star, mm -hmm. a very famous face. His voice was well known. He was associated with Disney. I mean, these are the things that you need in a leading man that's going to play a farting robot. Right. Because when you start getting into subject matter, like now I can have sex. Can I get married out of wedlock? I'm going to break up this wedding. Right. It, with, with the wrong face attached. Steve Buscemi. <laughs> Steve Buscemi breaking up well, a marriage and learning say, to have sex. It becomes a very creepy, underhanded movie. Bicentennial Man in another time with another actor is a really fascinating thing to think about. Yeah. But I still think, you know, Buscemi or not, I don't know why people pretend that the robot from Bicentennial Man isn't the fucking creepiest thing they've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> it is way scarier than people, you know, you have the cover and it's just a warm, happy, smiley robot. That thing is fucking scary. It's because it has the voice of the genie. I guess it's not scary compared to the respect dance button robot. Yeah. I think that's, oh my God, that might be the scariest thing we've ever seen on our show. Yeah. I just, also probably the most unnecessary hamster style ever on our show. What do you mean? Where at the end of the film, uh, they have that caretaker. Oh, sure. And yeah. she's like, unplug me. Okay. Thank you. Galatea. Bam. Yeah. Remember that robot? Right. Right. This is her. You know why that's necessary? <laughs> Credits.
Do you think having her in the movie is finally justified by the impact drill scene? Though? I think I think that Galatea serves two very strong purposes in this film. One is the impact drill. They push that a lot further than I expected yeah. them to go. It's pretty great. The other big thing that I think Galatea serves the purpose of is getting your and my young minds out of the gutter. Because the two things that I think Galatea would serve in a in a different type of film is Andrew would eventually end up with her because robots always end up with robots and black people should date black people and white right, people should right. date white people. Thanks for racist robot film. And the other thing that would have happened is right around the time Oliver Platt discovered how to make sexual organs, Galatea would have just become a sex robot. Yeah, you're right. As soon as I see her, I go, well, sex robots is out of the picture. Yeah. <laughs> if this is what a sex robot looks like, get me the fuck out of here. <laughs> I think the, uh, the biggest thing this movie's notable for, though, is the ambition it has. Oh, yeah. It's covering 200 fucking years. In only 40 hours. I <laughs> only four, right. 200 years over 40 hours is no small feat. 40 hours of film. You know, there's just so many different things we could talk about in here. I feel like we can't get through the conversation without just chewing on the idea of assigning a robot to make art. Yeah. That's just the most beautiful. Robots will follow orders. Okay, robot, go make art. It's just a mind fuck in itself. Mm -hmm. Also, nothing better than robots telling jokes. Sure. I could do a show on robots telling jokes. <laughs> the delivery and the whole thing. And it just starts in that cringeworthy, and it's still cringeworthy, but you can't help but laugh at it by the end of it. Yeah. Also, just to think about the power of humor to no matter what kind of social situation you're in, if you have a punchy joke where somebody has to think and then laugh, you know, as a gut reaction to kind of solving the joke for themselves, I don't know, it's such a disarming, sure, really beautiful human thing. But the place that the ambition is most interesting to me is covering this amount of time, just portraying this amount of time into the future in a film. Right. Because, all right, you've already established what one potential future looks like. It's slightly more futuristic, and people just bring robots into their homes. That's a normal thing. And, uh, and so we've tried the amusing exercise of predicting the future. We, we see Bicentennial Man's version of the future. But then we leap even further into the future. Mm -hmm. So when you predict the future, you've already done your best to give your take of what it kind of looks like, what you think will be cool. But then when you go, okay, you've exhausted all your options. Here's the most futuristic future you can give me. What if the character goes to sleep and wakes up in 20 years? Then what does the future look like? <laughs> it's just pushing yourself even further to go, oh, fuck, I didn't think about that. I mean, this idea of predicting the future, it's already kind of an interesting conversation. But once you've exhausted the conversation to then go, well, what about another two decades? What about another five decades? What about 100 years into the future? Right. Until we get to a point where I think they just can't portray it. Sure. It just gets more and more rustic. They stay inside houses more and more. Yep. The establishing shots get crazier and crazier looking. And, you know, people just, you see that thing where people stay indoors and the fashion and the aesthetic just returns to the right. you know, revolving four different types of aesthetics people have. Sure. You see a return to the classical 70s and the you know, spiky 90s. Right. And these things that we've already seen repeat themselves over and over just in our American history over the last hundred years. Sure. Vinyl comes back in. People start thinking about antique clocks, you know, right. the robots building all of these clocks. That sure. becomes kind of a thing. So I totally derailed you before on robots replacing us. Um, but that's something I thought about a lot in Bicentennial Man. Yeah. Is this concern of humans being replaced by robot workers. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, a relief, but no surprise to me to hear that you don't give a fuck about robots replacing. Yeah. Uh, this is something I've been interested in for a long time. I've always been opposed to the idea of, we can't further technology, what if humans run out of jobs? Yeah. I, I just, I wish I could get in a fight with you about that so we could have some kind of dialogue to kind of invoke all these ideas, but right. I just think it's fucking stupid. It is stupid. I think anybody who goes, let's artificially hold back human civilization for fear that my grocery checkout job will disappear, I, there's just no way to defend that. Yeah. That's the most moronic thing I've ever heard. I think that these two films, too, are a really good look at why that doesn't matter. Sure. Because I defy you to find two types of people, 
somebody who loves being a butler. <laughs> sure. And somebody who doesn't want an affordable butler. Right. A down payment butler. So Bicentennial Man is really the safest place to, to replace a human being. Yeah. Because you go, you don't need a butler because that's degrading. <laughs> Get a machine. Yeah, sure. It's, it's just, it's a Roomba that can open a fridge. Well, also talk about ambition, you know. Slavery is one of the ideas that's invoked. Freedom's invoked. Yeah. The movie really is touching on, you know, seven to ten different themes. Right. But yeah, Robot Butler, I think about now the self-checkout robots. That was the sure. that was the real big first one. Movie ticket taker robots. Uh-huh. You know, you started to see these kiosks uh, show up everywhere that were literally front and center you know, replacing people's jobs, Mm -hmm. not automotive industry, going back to that idea of dystopia Detroit. That's kind of funny, Uh, (laughs) kind of funny, also kind of real world tragic, but machines coming in and just doing the job of 10 men. Right. It's something certainly to be concerned for. But when you think about on a long enough timeline, this is something that has always happened and will always continue to happen. Right. It's a question. uh, I mean, if it's something you're actually concerned about, what you need to do is get really fucking good at inventing robots. That was my Mm -hmm. way of getting out of that. Yeah. You know, that uh, that amazing idea of staying ahead of the curve. You know, if you gave people what they want, then we never would have gotten a car. We would have just gotten faster horses. Right. You have to try and predict where technology is going to go. Sure. And then get there faster than everybody else. Right. Instead of playing the job of, oh, thank God, I finally got this movie ticket taker job. Well, I guess I don't have to worry about finding a job the rest of my life. Right. I haven't seen any robot replace a human doing a job that I feel like really takes a lot of skill. Yeah. It's not like anybody spent their entire life learning to be a grocery store checkout clerk. Right. People do that because they're young, they haven't had a job before, or they have some other extenuating circumstance that otherwise prevents them from getting other types of work. Sure. It's not like they've uh, spent an entire lifetime learning that craft. What that means is even if they do have a circumstance that prevents them from getting a let's even say a better job, they could probably get a different job with the same, you know, degree of hardship that they had finding this one in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's not like 20 years of effort totally wasted. Right. Right. Also, we just get a better planet. I mean, can we look at the bright side for a second? I don't want this entire thing to be overshadowed by the, uh, well, it sucks if you lose your job, but that's just the inevitability of human progress. But also, uh, hello, the human progress part. Mm-hmm. Roombas are fucking awesome. Yeah. I haven't had to sweep in my entire life. I love Roombas. I put things on them. They're funny. You make internet videos. The Roomba is great. Yep. I asked my robot how to drive places. Yeah. <laughs> One day I won't even have to drive myself. Technology is the best fucking thing in our lives. I love it. So uh, next time on Double Feature, we, uh, we're we going to be hiring two robots to do the show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, seriously. If, <laughs> it'll be if coming... we could have hit a bigger stretch goal, <laughs> I would have hired robots to do the show. Oh, yeah. But you're not too far off base, right? We had this Kickstarter to automate a lot of these different processes, to spend time investing in how do we farm this work out? How do we automate it? How do we get robots to do it? Right. How do we get the server to post things itself? You know, we're investing in double feature R&D to save you and I time so we can get back to the human art because robots still suck at creating art. Right. Oh, man. So that means we're done with Bicentennial Man, and I didn't even get to mention which actor from the West Wing showed up. <laughs> so uh, what are we doing next time? Um, next time we're coming live. We're going to be robots, we're going to be live, and we're going to be stealing the job away from AMFM radio hosts one hour at a time. Yeah. Uh, it's our year-end super finale. I don't, I don't know. I don't even, you sent me a list of the movies that we did this year. <laughs> I read like three of those pairs and then went to go yeah. get a Pop-Tart and then I forgot. <laughs> so. Right. We'll you are happens. so not prepared for the show at all. This is the least preparation of any show <laughs> and also appears to be on paper the most work we have to do. The interesting thing about the year-end show, and we'll talk about this a little bit next week, is that uh, every week our homework is to watch two movies. Mm-hmm. And then we talk about them. The year end show, our homework is to have watched 104 movies and not <laughs> right. talk about them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a spoiler free episode. So head over to the website, doublefeatureshow.com. You can look at everything we did this year. 
And uh, if you if you're missing out on movies this week because there's nothing to watch for next week, why don't you go ahead and watch a couple of those that you uh, you didn't see this time around? Because they're pretty much all great or terrible. I don't know. I I mean, who's to say? But let's go with great. Yep. Um, Double feature show at gmail dot com is where you can send us an email. We probably won't read on the show. And uh, until next time, I think that's it for us. All right. Watch more fucking film. Bye.